Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vaga Maradian at the Surface Navy Association's annual conference and trade show uh, in Arlington, Virginia, the 29th gathering of this great event. Our coverage here is sponsored by Raytheon, and we have with us a good friend of mine, Roger Sexauer, who's the Executive Vice President for Business Development at DRS Technologies. Roger, great to see you. Great to see you again, Vago, and thanks for spending some time with me today. Um, it's it's always a pleasure, uh, and you know we're going around to companies and talking about what they've got that's new and exciting that they're trying to bring over to the Navy customer. And anytime you think about directed energy and lasers, it's really really cool. And I noticed that you guys are have a laser on display. Tell us a little bit about yes, it. Yes, do. So we actually are not the laser provider; we're the power provider for the laser. And several years ago, we won a program with the Navy to provide the a system called the uh, Energy Magazine Laser which is a pulse power power pack basically that allows the laser that powers a laser when it shoots off its short burst energy and it's a lithium battery thing with a battery management system and some power conversion technology but leverages a lot of the work we've done at DDG 1000 and some of the other naval platforms that we work on and uh, and obviously without the power you don't have the laser and especially with solid-state lasers it's about how quickly you can store that power discharge it and do it effectively what are some of the unique features you guys have on that, and how soon before it's going to be in the hands of the fleet? Right, so right now, it, it's uh, it's in the hands of the fleet right now. The Navy's just trying to figure out precisely what they want and when they want it. Uh, one of the things we are working on, so it's, re it's off the shelf, ready to go right now. It's a lithium-ion battery that we're using uh, in the battery management system with a company partner called Lithium Start. Uh, we, again, do the power conversion. Uh, we're ready to go. We've, we've tested it. We've qualified it. We're ready. It's just a matter of when the Navy wants to adapt a uh, laser weapon, and then we're ready to go. And is this a scalable technology, or is this something that's only for the smaller end? No, no, no. It's somewhat scalable, absolutely. We, it's, it's basically an uninterrupted power supply, but a much larger version of an uninterrupted power supply. Uh, and one, one of the things we're doing is also looking at other battery technologies as that evolves to see how we can integrate it into the system because it's a battery agnostic system. We don't care whether it's a lithium battery, a silver aluminum oxide, or some new technology. Hybrid drive, obviously people have a tendency of thinking about hybrid cars, but the Navy has been looking at this shift to all electric ships, electric propulsion, uh, better power distribution, uh, you know, DDG 1000 being a powerful example of it, and that's a program that you guys obviously have been involved with as well. Talk to us a little bit about the hybrid drive system you guys have on display here. Yeah, so several years ago, I want to say a half a dozen or so, we introduced a hybrid electric concept to the Navy. They loved it. We demonstrated a system in Philadelphia. It was successful. They then ran a competition and are now integrating that system on DDG 51s. What we've also done is international navies got the idea of this. Uh, we sold one and actually last year we delivered and tested our first system to the Korean Navy and it's inline and shaft driven system. Uh, there are two versions that we're showing right now, a, a gear driven system which is done on DDGs, a shaft driven system which we do on uh, Korean ships. We've also taught the Italian Navy, we're working with the Spanish Navy right now, so it's something that and we're working on the offshore patrol craft also with Eastern. Uh, we'll be providing them with a hybrid electric drive system as well. So a lot of exciting stuff, a lot of people are adapting this technology. Um, let's also go to guns. You guys, uh, obviously the 76 millimeter gun, uh, staple on the frigate fleet for the longest time, staple on the Coast Guard fleet. Uh, obviously there was that transition to the Mark 110 system, uh, the 57 millimeter mount that's on the LCS, uh, the littoral combat ship, as well as on the big Coast Guard cutters. Um, talk to us a little bit about what you guys are doing there because there, there was an assumption that the 76 was going to equip uh, the frigate version of the littoral combat ship. As far as you know, you know, where does that stand right now, and what's the future of this program for the company in the United States? Yeah, I think the 76 millimeter gun relative to that, we did work with the Navy very closely to determine what the impact of the ship would be by integrating the gun onto the ship, and then what the increase in capability would be with that, cap with that gun. Obviously, greater caliber equals greater firepower. Uh, I think that evaluation is somewhat in progress. However, I would say the Navy is way leaning towards sticking with the 50 cylinder main rig gun and, and integrating other capabilities such as missiles and small guns into the ship system. Um, having said that, one of the things that really gained a lot of attention as we were going through the 76 millimeter discussion was guided munitions. Um, the Itali this is an Italian gun. It's a, they've sold over 100 systems to various international navies. It's out there and guided munitions are out there as well. Uh, the U.S. Navy is interested in that, and right now in the near term, one of the things they're looking at is trying to get a more affordable alternative to what they currently have on the DDG-1000 Zumwalt class. Uh, it turns out that our partners from our parent company, Leonardo, have an existing six-inch uh, six inch round that is guided that has a range in excess of 60 kilometers. Uh, we're working with the Navy. Actually, we had a meeting today with Captain Ladner, the PEO IWS guy in charge of uh, weapons and munitions. 
and they're going to, this June, test some of these existing international things, not only ours, but BAEs, Lockheed Martins, working on improvement to what they've got right now, Raytheon. Uh, so we'll, we'll go out, we'll see what we've got, and then the Navy will decide what they want to do as far as a competition. But it's kind of exciting in that they're, they're leveraging not only the Lockheed technology, but what, seeing what else is out there internationally. And um, you guys see an opportunity potentially for the Zumwalt bullets, right? Because that contract has been stopped. Right. I think I think absolutely the short ter short term is is a six inch round for a Zumwalt. However, there also has been ongoing activity for the DG 51s as well. And turns out, Adamalera uh, of Leonardo now has a, they also have a five inch gun ammunition. So, I, I'm, my view of the world is if we can be successful on the six inch round the natural course of events would be to leverage that for the five inch round as well. Let's talk about also things about um, cutting cost of delivery. You, you guys have a very interesting story about how you're taking almost 30% out of the cost of building systems. Talk to us about that. Yeah, so better buying power three is now the thing. It's, it's largely the Navy has implemented that via built to print systems for combat systems. Uh, DRS has been very successful, you said. What we're showing here at the show today is the a copper engagement capability, built to print activity, uh, which Raytheon is the prime integrator for that country. We're building a significant amount of hardware. We delivered our first systems last year. Uh, two of them are here right now. And uh, I think we've won several programs on the submarine force as well for the technology insertion hardware, for the common display system, many, many programs. And as, as you alluded to, the Navy's seeing real, real savings. We just actually lost the program, the surface, uh, the electronic warfare improvement program. Uh, Lockheed Martin, the incumbent, won that. but. My belief is looking at POMs and looking at previous prices that the Navy saved about 30% just by running that competition. So very, very successful program. Um, you, uh, you're a submariner, you're a Naval Academy graduate, uh, you've worked in the defense industry your entire career. Uh, there are some questions folks have about whether or not you know, international companies will have the access to the U.S. market given the uh, incoming Trump administration's focus on Buy American. You know, do you guys see a potential challenge with that in that you're an all-American company, DRS is an all-American company, but its parent happens to be uh, headquartered in Rome. Yeah, I think that we're going to be okay. One of the things that we try to do when we explain to our parent and our partners, for example, on the weapons and on the gun, we have to come up with a scheme, A, that there's going to be a significant amount of content built in the United States. So really, they're transferring technology to us. So, for example, on the gun, we're going to build some for the Israeli Navy uh, under Farm Authority funding, Farm Authority Sales Program. We'll build 51% of that gun here. We build no guns here now. So that's huge technology transfer coming our way. Same type of thing with the munitions. So I think it's a real opportunity actually to, to create jobs by transferring that capability into the United States. It is a challenge. There always is that mantra that buy, build in the U.S. But we're going to build in the U.S., but we should leverage the technology of other countries if it's available so we don't have to spend the extra R&D money to go develop those things. Sir, thanks very much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Vago. Great seeing you again.